Hi, I'm Jay John. Welcome to the Just 10 series here in London. We're looking at God's 10 commandments and we're looking at the eighth commandment, do not steal. And the title is how to prosper with a clear conscience. The title tonight is How to Prosper with a Clear Conscience. A sign at a bed and breakfast read, please introduce yourself to your fellow guests since we are one big happy family. The management is not responsible for valuables left in your room. <laughs> what is that? Did you know that there were 363,814 theft offences recorded by the police in London in 2022? That's just London, let alone the rest of the UK, let alone the whole of the world. The Eighth Commandment reads, you shall not steal. A man walked into a bank and said, give me all your money. The cashier replied, straighten your tie. Your picture is being taken. <laughs> you see, God sees. And when God says, do not steal, he is keeping a watch on those who do. Now, before I tell you the right ways to prosper, let me tell you the wrong ways to prosper. Here are the wrong ways to prosper. Dishonesty. Listen to what the Bible says. Proverbs 11, verse 1. The Lord detests the use of dishonest scales, but he delights in accurate weights. In other words, don't swindle people. Killy and I, we had a leak in our toilet. Called in a plumber. The plumber comes, he goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. He goes, oh, mate, are you, you're going to need a complete new system. The whole thing's going to come out. You're going to need a new toilet and everything else. And then there was a pause. And I said to him, do I look stupid? <laughs> do I look stupid? I said, do you think I'm stupid? I said, get out of my house. And all I needed was a little rubber ring, 50p. <laughs> it's never leaked for 25 years. <laughs> God warns us against dishonesty, one. Number two, God warns us against defrauding. Number two, God warns us against defrauding. The income tax department received an anonymous letter. I am having trouble sleeping because of my conscience. Please find enclosed a hundred pounds. If this doesn't cure my insomnia, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> the Bible says, Romans 13, verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. Why is it that most sick days in England are taken on Fridays and Mondays. <laughs> Who wants a long weekend? Huh? Who fancies a long weekend? Oh, just make a little call. <coughs> I can't come in for a week because you want, you've just found this new series. So you want to have a week's holiday. 
bosses. Don't manipulate your employees. Employees, don't take advantage of your bosses. Small thefts add up to huge losses. And the most common theft at work is theft of time. Come to work late, leave early, take long coffee breaks, and waste the rest. And some people have the attitude, when they go to work, how little can I do, and how much can I get paid? I got a summer job with the council here in London when I was a student. And the job that I got with the council was to go and cut the grass on roundabouts. So we arrived, this little this van with, there were six of us in the van, and we arrived, roundabout, first roundabout was Mill Hill. My boss gave me the shears. He says, right, your first job, you've got to shear around the edges. I said, oh, OK. So I start shearing. He comes along and goes, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, what, what, what do you mean? He goes, what, what, what are you doing? I said, I'm, 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 I'm shearing the edge, you told me. He goes, slow down. <laughs> if you do it that fast, we'll have to do it that fast when you're gone. <laughs> now, you know if you don't put much energy in shears, they don't really move, do they? So I'm like, you've got to put a bit of energy in the shears, and if you do it slow motion, they don't really close. <laughs> Anyway, a few minutes later, the boss goes, time out, time out, get in the van. I said, what for? He goes, it's raining. <laughs> I said, where? Where is it raining? He goes, I felt a drop. <laughs> no, this is a true story. I spent six weeks sitting in the van <laughs> reading books. I hardly cut grass. I was employed by the council. God warns us against dishonesty. God warns us against defrauding. And thirdly, God warns us against downloading. Oh, that's a bit sensitive. Millions of people use illegal downloads costing billions. Many of us wouldn't walk out of a store with, with a DVD or something like that. So why do we do it online? Dishonesty, defrauding, downloading, and fourthly, God warns us against defaulting. Defaulting means failing to fulfill an obligation we've made. The Bible again, Romans 13, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding. Again, the Bible, Psalm 37, 21. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Have you borrowed money without ever having any intention of paying it back? What things have you borrowed that you haven't returned? The writer, Anatoly France, wrote this. Never lend books, for no one ever returns them. The only books I have in my library are books other people lent me. <laughs> the golden rule. What's the golden rule? The golden rule that Jesus gave, do for others whatever you would like them to do for you. What are the right ways to prosper? Okay, three principles. Number one, by working. Number one, by working. The Bible, Proverbs 14, 23. Work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Again, the Bible, Ephesians 4, 28. 
Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. God intends for us to work. Now, that is not necessarily the same as having a job. Many hardworking people don't earn a wage, but the work that many do in bringing up children is the most demanding and crucial of all and should be commended. What we must be wary of is laziness. The emphasis of the Bible is not referring to those people who cannot work, but to those who will not work. If you can work, you should work. Principle one. Principle two, saving. Number one, working. Number two, saving. Again, the Bible, Proverbs 21, five. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. The Bible is full of principles of saving and investing wisely. And Jesus commended the wise investor in Matthew chapter 25. Working, saving, and thirdly, praying. Working, saving, praying. Said the robin to the sparrow, I would surely like to know why these anxious human beings fret about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I imagine it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Jesus said in Matthew 7, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? My wife, Killy, and I, we can testify on many, many occasions, answers to a financial need as a direct result of prayer. I'll give you one example. We lived in a very small little house, a little small terraced house. Our office was in our home. Uh, we had our first son. And, you know, it was a bit tight. We needed somewhere bigger. And we started looking around. We went and saw a house. We walked into this house. And even though the house, the price of the house was way more than what we had and what we could afford, we really felt we should go and see this house. So we, we see the house, we walk around the house, and then my wife and I, we just go into one of the rooms to have a little conversation, and we both said, this is the house. This is the house. Even though way above what we had. And we felt the Lord said to us, in that moment, don't negotiate the price, don't offer a lower price, give them what they're asking for. So we met the couple, we said, we love to buy the house and we'll give you what you're asking for. And they were delighted and we shook hands on it and it was great. Anyway, the next, I then contact our solicitor, who's a friend of ours called Costa, and uh, I tell him about that house and he goes, John, do tell me, you haven't got the money. I said, no, I haven't got the money. He goes, oh no. <laughs> And I said, I, I want a solicitor who prays. And he's like, I'm your solicitor. I said, well, you got to pray for the money. I haven't got the money. I need some money. Anyway, so he's like, I got him on me as well. The next day, the couple ring us, right? Now, the couple's Jewish. And he, he says to me, oh, Mr. John, Mr. John, since you left yesterday, uh, we had three other people visit the house and they've offered us higher price than what we'd asked. So if you're willing to match the higher price, we, we'd love to give it to you. So I said, okay, let me talk to my wife. So I talked to Killy, we pray about it. I ring him back. I said, listen, my wife and I just prayed about it 
and Yahweh, remember they're Jewish, I said, <laughs> Yahweh said, stay at the offer that we made for you. And he said, ah, you talked to Yahweh, did you? <laughs> I said, I did. And I said, Yahweh knows what you're doing. And he told me to stay at the offer that you agreed. And he said, you tell Yahweh you're not going to get the house. <laughs> so I said, I actually don't need to tell Yahweh anything. He knows what you just said. And that ended the conversation. I was a little bit disheartened, a bit discouraged. We both were convinced this was the house. It was the house. Anyway, well, we got it wrong. We got it wrong. A week later, he phones up again. He says, Mr. John, you're not going to believe this. My wife and I have not slept for a whole week. <laughs> we want you to have the house at the price we agreed. I said, shall I tell Yahweh? <laughs> he said, I think Yahweh already knows. <laughs> well, of course Yahweh already knows. Wait a minute, there's more to the story. There's more to the story. We've got this massive shortfall, right? I'm in regular contact with our solicitor, Costa. Anyway, I ring him up. I said, back on, back on, Costa. He goes, have you got the money? I said, no. <laughs> He says, right, come and see me tomorrow. So the next day, we make an appointment to go and see our friend, the solicitor, Costa. The next morning, the post arrives before we go and see Costa. And my wife gets a letter from her godmother. And her godmother wrote to her, and we've not been in contact with her godmother, like, for years. <laughs> and the godmother wrote several days before and said, Killy, I was praying for you and John today and the Lord told me that the money I had assigned for you in my will when I died, he told me to send it to you now. Is it useful? <laughs> Is it useful? We go into Costa's office. I said, Costa, did you pray? He goes, I did, I did. I slapped the check on this table. There it is. And it was exactly what we needed to bridge the difference. <laughs> Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Yes, you know, I, I couldn't work any harder. I couldn't save any more. So, working, saving, praying. There's a story in the Bible about a man called Zacchaeus. And he was a despised tax collector who overcharged people and he pocketed the difference. Zacchaeus was very wealthy, but he wasn't happy. His desperation sparked in him a longing to see Jesus. But because Zacchaeus was vertically challenged, he climbed a tree and he went out on a limb. <laughs> Jesus sees what Zacchaeus is willing to do, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to come to your house for dinner. Jesus wanted to visit Zacchaeus with all of his thoughts and his greed. I can imagine at Zacchaeus' house, Jesus saying, Zacchaeus, tell me about your job. How's it going? <laughs> Are you fiddling the books? <laughs> and before he knew it, Zacchaeus poured out his heart to Jesus, confessing how he had been stealing from people. Before the conversation is over, 
Zacchaeus was a transformed man. Some of you know what you've done or you're doing now is wrong. We're all guilty. The question is, what do we do with guilt? Some people deny it. Other people deflect it. They blame other people. They blame their parents. They blame their teachers. They blame someone. Some people know that they're guilty and they, the only way they can survive is to drown it. They might drown it with music. They might drown it with drink. They might drown it with drugs. But listen, if you're guilty, you cannot deny it, you cannot deflect it, and you cannot drown it. If you're guilty, the only thing that you can do to get rid of it is to dissolve it in the blood of Jesus. But when Jesus becomes our Lord and empowers us with his Holy Spirit, he will clean our lives and he will help us to live different lives. Do you know that the, the name Zacchaeus, do you know what it means? It means pure. I think Jesus didn't just see a crooked tax collector. He saw a man who could become pure. I think he looks at us. He knows what we've done, but he knows that we can be pure. Encountering Jesus is liberating. Because of Jesus, we can experience forgiveness and cleansing. One of the most amazing truths is that when we receive Christ's forgiveness, listen to what the Bible says, Hebrews 8, 12, he remembers our sins no more. Oh, wow. He remembers our sins no more. Oh, he remembers our sins no more. And after Zacchaeus got to know Jesus, he demonstrated his transformed life. And he paid back four times what he had stolen and gave half of his money to the poor. You see, Zacchaeus forgets his past and he writes his wrongs. And Jesus said to him, I love this, today, salvation has come to this house. Amen. Now, it's easy to say, I've met Jesus. I'm a Christian. But the proof is in what we do. Has there been a change in our behavior? Has there been a change in our actions? God will and wants to forgive us. But like Zacchaeus, we have to make restitution with others in order to demonstrate the forgiveness that we've received from Jesus. The act of restitution, giving back something that has been stolen, is a biblical principle. I always wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And um, I, 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 would, um, I, I stole a number of plastic surgery encyclopedias <laughs> from a bookshop in London called Foils. I had a little jacket. The encyclopedias were very, I mean, they were like 120 pounds each. And, and I was a, you know, I could flick it into my jacket, zip up the jacket, walk away with it. So I had, I had three of these. So I become a Christian. Nobody says anything to me. But within days, I felt God said to me, take the books back. Take them back. No one said anything to me. So I, I'm carrying these encyclopedias. I mean, they're really heavy, heavy. So I go back to foils. I find someone in the bookshop. Uh, and I said, excuse me. I said, I stole these books. <laughs> but I just met Jesus and Jesus told me to bring them back. And the assistant's like, oh my, you know. <laughs> anyway, like, wait here. Anyway, cut a long story short, within about, within about 30 minutes, I am sitting in front of the director of the bookshop. 
The bookshop says to me, now, tell me. I said, well, I stole these books because I wanted to be a plastic surgeon, but I didn't have the money, and I really liked these books, so I stole them, did it, and I told them when I stole them. But I said, I met Jesus, and Jesus told me to bring them back. The director said to me, do you realize I could call the police now? That never occurred to me. <laughs> I was like, oh no, my mum's gonna kill me. <laughs> he said, but I've never been so surprised in my life. He says, you're free to go. And I tell you this, as I went out, I remember I, was, there were, I had to go down lots of stairs. I jumped the stairs, like I would <laughs> jump like five stairs. I was like, yes! Yes! And it was like I walked out of the bookshop. Yes! I'm free! And I was liberated. You can be liberated. Encounter Jesus. If you would like to do that, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I call out to you now. I come to you just as I am. I know I have broken your commandments. And I thank you that you died on the cross for me to purchase for me forgiveness. I ask you now to cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. Come into my life by your Holy Spirit. I want you to reign and rule over my life. I want you to be resident and president. Fill me now with your peace, your presence, and your power. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>